My name is Corey Tressler. Uh, I work with the Digital First team at Ohio State, and today we're going to cover a little bit of uh, sort of ed tech movement uh, in K-12 education, specifically around mobile tech. Uh, first, a little bit what Digital First does. Our website is digitalfirst.osu.edu. Um, we're doing a lot with, with trying to inspire innovative instruction through emerging technology like iPads, iPhones, uh, using things like iTunes U courses, uh, iBooks, all sorts of things like that um, to really change the landscape a little bit of, of education here at Ohio State. Really trying to, to provide digital access to our students 24-7. Um, so we've been around since uh, May of 2012 um, and we have a lot of momentum going here at Ohio State so it's really nice. So I really encourage you to visit our website. Um, a little bit about me. Um, I am an educational technologist now here at Ohio State. Uh, I did my undergraduate work at Ohio State, and I was a staff member in the library for a number of years. And then I moved away to South Carolina and got my master's degree in education. And then I became a teacher at an elementary school in South Carolina. Then I became a tech coach, is what we called it, uh, sort of working and training teachers in the K-12 world on how to use technology. Then I became the coordinator for, at the district level and then the director of uh, virtual learning at a school district in South Carolina that was, was pretty big and we were pretty fortunate to have what we had and what they still have as far as, as tech goes. Um, so today what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk through a little bit about my experience but also my experience sort of through the landscape. Um, I have been fortunate that I worked about seven, eight years in K-12 that I presented at quite a few conferences, at ed tech conferences, um, and was really able to see a lot of what was going on throughout the world, or the United States at least, um, and compare that to what we were doing in South Carolina. So here's a little snapshot of our district. Um, it's in Beaufort County School District. It's in a beautiful place in South Carolina on the coast. If you ever heard of Hilton Head Island, Hilton Head Island is in the county that we're in. Um, so we have a little over 20,000 students. Uh, you can see the, the breakdown of race there. Um, we have about 3,000 staff, and the big thing that stands out on this slide to a lot of people that when they think about Hilton Head Island and they think about the coast in general, they're thinking about very wealth, if you will, and, and a lot of million dollar houses. Uh, our school district was 56% free and reduced lunch. So we did a lot with Title I funding from the federal government. Um, so that helped us uh, subsidize some of our own money in the local community to get more computers and get more technology, which I'll go through. So we did have 31 schools, and, and you can see the breakdown here. So it was a pretty, pretty large school district. Um, this is sort of what we looked like in 2007. So this is about six years ago now. Um, and this was, this was towards the beginning. I started maybe a year before this. Uh, we had a computer ratio of about you know, 3.7 computers, or 3.7 students to every one computer, uh, which is which is a little high, and it, but it's still not too bad. Our teachers and admins did not have laptops. This is pre-iPad, of course, so there wasn't a lot of mobile technology at this point. Um, one of the biggest weaknesses we had at this point was we had no wireless infrastructure, um, extremely limited bandwidth as far as the internet. So even the teachers that were using internet resources were struggling with it uh, because of that bandwidth issue. No email. Um, no personal technology allowed in the buildings at all. So even a teacher wasn't allowed to bring their own laptop and teach off of it. Uh, it was a very strict sort of network environment and a very, very limited number of classroom websites, um, which, which to me was, which was quite damaging because that's sort of that web present that starts the 24-7 classroom uh, because if you can't provide the resources to students at home, you're never going to get past sort of the traditional school day. Uh, so at that time, there was no climate of sort of that anywhere all the time learning. Alan. Quick question. Um, yep. In terms of the student-to-computer ratio, of course, one-to-one -one would probably be ideal. Yep. But what's the best that you've seen? What's the average, you think, across the U.S.? Um, what I've seen over the years, the average is about three-to-one, um, and it's starting to go farther down. Now, that's different every place, but with the, you know, sort of the invent of the iPad, it's pushing that ratio way up because there's more districts that are doing, going more mobile. And, and you, you, know, you can argue, is the iPad a computer or not? 
well, it is a tablet computer, so that, that adds to that ratio. So I would say three to one's okay, but the goal is one to one. Um, and you can see, and I'll just flip to the slide, that in 2012, so just last year, we got to a two, two to one ratio in this school district in five years. Um, we also had all of our teachers with uh, laptops, all the administrators and, and quite a few of the teachers with laptops and iPads. Um, our wireless was probably the biggest change is that every classroom had wireless access and had enough to support about 50 devices per classroom. Um, and in high schools you're in, in middle schools and elementary, you're not going to have a 50 person classroom. Usually it's going to be more in the 30s. Uh, so we were, we were able to support that. We kicked up our bandwidth quite a bit. Uh, we went to Google Apps for Education, which that pulls in email then and a lot of uh, home access to sort of uh, word processing and presentation software through Google Docs, or it's now called Google Drive. Um, and the big thing is, it, it just started, and I worked a lot really hard on this, is to allow personal technology into the buildings, uh, both from the teacher level and the student level, to sort of capitalize on the iPhone sort of generation, uh, students with their own iPads or Kindles or whatever they have, is to sort of open up that policy, and it actually had to go through the school board to get that policy changed to do more of a bring your own technology, which here in higher ed, we've been doing for years. We've been providing wireless for students to bring their laptops to class, but that's a big shift in K-12 because of the liability and concerns about what students, young students are gonna do. Um, another thing we did, and, I, and I'll sort of talk through this as we go, is we did put interactive whiteboards and sound systems into every classroom. Um, and I'll talk about sort of, in hindsight, that that probably wasn't the best bang for our buck. Um, the sound systems, I would say, were, but we're, we're seeing and I'm seeing in, in sort of my views on K-12 and really education as a whole, is the interactive whiteboards are dying. And I'll kind of talk through that in this presentation. Um, and then another big part, as I said before, in, in 2007, with no sort of online presence for our, for our teachers, to now shift to where we were using a website called Edmodo, where it's sort of a small, thin uh, learning management system that allowed for turning in assignments, 24-7 access to resources, and it's free. So that was a big shift in our, in our district, and I'm seeing that sort of now as well. So the biggest change in these five years, or five past six years or so, has been mobile technology. Uh, the iPad's now about two and a half years old. It's approaching three years old rapidly, uh, which is funny because it's become such a part of our culture that everybody knows what an iPad is and things like that. And it's been about six-ish years, I believe, since the iPhone came on the scene. And of course, that resulted in a, in a huge smartphone boom uh, leading to more Androids and things like that. So going back to sort of my example, what I've seen is that it starts with infrastructure. Um, and then you can see that even at higher ed. If you don't have the technology infrastructure to do some of these things with mobile technology, you're never going to be able to. Um, so in looking at some of the rural schools in Ohio, that's probably their biggest hurdle to doing some of these innovative things with students bringing their own computers or providing iPads or whatever to students is they don't have the bandwidth to support that. Um, many smaller school districts and schools don't have tech support. Uh, there's not, at the moment, a really good service model for maybe partnering with a third-party company to provide tech support. Um, and then the big thing is, is that wireless infrastructure, that our schools just aren't ready to have 30 different devices in a classroom. So we were fortunate in, in South Carolina to pass a bond referendum, a pretty substantial one. Um, and we, got, we built five new schools with that. But also I had a very forward and creative uh, superintendent that put a line item that just said upgrade technology infrastructure in all buildings. That's all it said. Didn't have a dollar sign attached to that. So we were, because of that ability to write that into this referendum, we were able to take that money and build out a wireless infrastructure in all of our schools, not just the five new ones, but sort of retrofit every building. So a lot of that goes to her in that she was thinking, we need to upgrade this, and she had just been hired. So she kind of slipped it in there very cleverly, and it worked out really, really well, and it was, uh, it was one of the biggest things we could have done at that time, so it was really nice. Um, that money also was sort of 
supplemented, and we used some of our own sort of uh, traditional funds where they upgraded a data center to sort of handle and, and to build out this kind of need and this sort of center hub for, for managing all this, this new wireless. Also in that time, um, I guess this was about 2008, all the teachers got their laptops. And when we did this, uh, we created a new cycle for sort of end of life machines, which in public education, and this is the same throughout the country, there are a lot of very strict rules about how, how you can use those machines after they've reached end of life. So one thing we always wanted to do in South Carolina and never could uh, legally, unfortunately, was you know, we had old desktop computers or old laptops after five years or four years. We wanted to try to give those to the students so they could use them at home, especially the students that didn't have access at home traditionally, uh, traditionally our more poor students. Um, and we were fortunate to have Comcast, which has a program that if you're, if you're on free and reduced lunch, you can get broadband internet service at your house for $9.99 a month. The problem, though, is, is not all of our students had desktops or laptop computers, so their families never really took advantage of that really great plan that Comcast had. Now, that's changed the last two or years or so where there's a lot more mobile devices, um, so families do have the mobile devices, but maybe not a traditional computer. So we did give all the students, uh, or all the teachers, laptops. Um, we started a cycle of refreshing all of the computers. Uh, one thing we saw in our buildings about five or six years ago is there was gateway computers over here, Dells, some old apples, and I, well, I mean old, very old apples, um, and just a hodgepodge of different computers. And it became really difficult from an IT standpoint to maintain 15 or 16 varieties of computers as far as model numbers. So we basically, when we did the, the refresh cycle, is we took everything out of the building and put something new in, and, and standardized at that time on HP computers so that we only had maybe three or four models to sort of support, um, and we did a lot of more of sort of wireless supporting of those. Um, so again, that was big into moving the teachers to start thinking digitally, is to get them at least laptops, so that they could take that home and do grading at home, could build their PowerPoints, at that time it was a lot of PowerPoints, to be ready for the next day, and have a machine that is all right there, and they just attach it to the projector the next day. Um, and then, this is about the time in about 2008, we had just done the laptops, we had just done sort of the pre-C refresh cycle, and really updating the infrastructure and doing a lot with that, that the iPods came on the scene. And specifically the iPod Touches was what really changed it um, the following year. So in 2008, uh, an English as a second language teacher from Hilton Head Middle School, which had a huge, which still does, has a huge number of Spanish-speaking students um, that, that come there, and their parents work a lot in the tourism industry, um, that they didn't speak any English at all. At all. So this teacher went to a conference uh, and saw a teacher in New Jersey that was using traditional iPods, uh, the big classic ones with the little rotator thing on them, to teach English as a second language students. And, had, and it was very effective because it was a lot of... Uh, sort of like the Rosetta Stone of, of being immersed in the language with flashcards, a lot of listening to English and repeating back, or reading a book and having the book also being read to you. Um, so they were doing a lot of really neat sort of basic projects with sort of just listening, which, which we were doing in the past with cassette tapes and before that vinyl recordings, but this was an easy way and a portable way to do that uh, through the iPod. So we started with one school with the iPods, um, and then in 2009, that's when the iPod Touch came out, we started transitioning to the iPod Touches. So we were fortunate to be able to use, again, some federal money uh, because we had such a high number of ESL students to use, I think it's called Title V funding, um, to bring in some iPod Touches in all the schools that had a really high ESOL population. And when the Touch came out, now the apps weren't, quite what they are today with, you know, millions of apps out there, but there were a good bit of, of especially language learning apps at that time to do things like flashcards, to do things like loading some videos from Discovery Education on there, um, to, and again, to do a bunch of sort of uh, listening activities, some sort of closed activities. Um, 
So we started to do that in about 2009 at about six schools. It started to grow from there. We went to about 10 or 11 schools with iPod Touches. And this is sort of small scale, uh, maybe 30 to 60, depending on the building size, and only used in those ESL classrooms. So not, not in sort of the general ed. They were doing math, science, language arts on the iPod Touches, but it never floated out into th the whole school. Um, and that primarily was because we had a lot of issues with them. Again, this was 2009, so this is a number of years ago. We were a heavy PC environment, uh, so we didn't have any technicians that were very Apple-friendly. Um, but also, the iOS was so new, we didn't, they didn't even know where to begin with sort of managing it. So syncing was the biggest, biggest problem at that time. Um, back when the iPod Touches were first released, if you wanted to load the iPod Touches in a cart of 30, it could take up to 24 hours to sync one cart. So that was hard for it to tell a teacher that, you know, you got to prepare everything and load it on, into iTunes, plug in your cart, and then sort of just let it go. Um, throughout the whole night, it's running and trying to sync these 30 iPods, and it, it failed quite a bit. Uh, Alan? Just a quick question yeah. about you. So when you had the iPods, were they used only in the classroom? So, you know, the idea is almost if they had those kind of devices, they'd use that time outside of class to come back, but it was only in class? It was only in class at this time, and that was another sort of the limitations. They never went home with the child, which, which would have been really cool at that point to be able to do that so they could continue learning activities, especially the listening activities. Um, but we just didn't have any sort of policy or governance in place on the liability side of saying, okay, you can take this iPod Touch home with you. Um, now, I can say we didn't lose any. We didn't have any stolen. We didn't have any major damages or anything like that. But we just weren't ready at that time four years ago to, to do more of a, a true one-to-one, -one, even in small scale in, in some of these courses. Um, but the biggest, the biggest thing we found is that it was not user-friendly at that time to use them in an education environment as far as syncing. And the other thing we had a problem with was our network. In, in K-12, you have to do a lot of filtering of your internet uh, because you, you're dealing with teens and, and younger students. So there is the Child Internet Protection Act. So all K-12 schools have to filter their internet from things like pornography, um, cheating websites, um, things like uh, all sorts of stuff out there that you just have to, to be mindful of. So at that time, our network wasn't extremely dynamic, so it was all or nothing. So at that time, they were blocking iTunes for everyone. So our teachers, who had the few of them that had these iPod Touches, couldn't even get on iTunes at school to start preparing to load the apps. So again, it's hard to tell a teacher that's already overworked, here's a MacBook, this is great, you have a bunch of iPod Touches, this is going to cause about 40 or 50 extra hours of work every week just managing the thing and not having a lot of support from the IT department because it's an Apple product in a PC environment because, again, a lot of IT guys aren't, aren't fans of both, or especially back then, four years ago, where it wasn't quite ingrained in a reality. Um, so while we were doing that, um, it was starting to take some, some, some steam. It was gaining some momentum. And, and we did get some good feedback from the students. And the, and the teachers started to adapt to uh, create situations that made it you know, a little bit more seamless with the touches, but it still wasn't perfect. We were doing that sort of on the southern part of our county. And on the northern part of the county, we built a new school. Uh, we built Whale Branch Early College High School, and it opened in 2010. And we decided to go fully one-to-one. -one. Um, this was a high school in the poorest area of our county. Uh, about Title I numbers, about 90 to 95 percent of the students were on free and reduced lunch. So we were able to subsidize the, the sort of the budget for that building with federal dollars because of the high poverty level in that area. So we said this is an opportunity to do more with technology. Um, it was a smaller school, about 400 students, so it's a nice little isolated group that we could do these type of things and have less staff and faculty to train because it's such a small building. It's not like a building of 10,000, it's a building of 400. So we went with the HP Mini Touchscreen Netbook. It was a uh, business class little netbook. 
Um, again, this was right when the iPad had just been sort of announced, so it wasn't even really on the market yet. Uh, we did, I know I did sort of start looking at it and was very interested in it, but, but again, back to the technology, we just weren't ready to support an iPad at that point in 2010. We had a ton of issues with these, these little mini netbooks. Um, they high damages, really, really high damage rate. Um, probably in the, the upwards of 35 to 40% of them became back damaged. They did go home with the students. We did not buy any sort of rubberized casings like on an iPad you can get a nice robust otter box or whatever. This was a little netbook. We did provide them book bags, but again, when you're dealing with high school students that are tough on everything, you know, they kind of throw their book bag down to the side, so we saw a lot of screen damages. Um, we were... So, yeah, smart enough in hindsight to, uh, to build in a warranty with HP through those that the students could have maybe one or two damages a year and it, the student wouldn't have to pay. Uh, but that caused a lot of other issues and it was extremely expensive to do that. Um, so that was probably the biggest issue was damages and having those repairs. The other really sort of the curriculum side of it is we did a lot of things sort of with with going kind of paperless with word processing and presentations and making some movies and things like that. But really, it, it, one of the big things was there was no textbook options. Um, in South Carolina, and, and a lot of states are like this, Ohio's not quite like this, uh, the State Department of Education determines the adoption rate of the textbooks. So if the state doesn't fund new textbooks, the schools either have to go on their own and buy them 100% with their own money, or just wait. So most school districts in South Carolina just wait because they don't have the funds to buy all these expensive textbooks. And at that time, all the textbooks they had had no digital options at all, not even a PDF. So from an instructional standpoint and sort of a immersing the student into the need to use these, these netbooks, we had some teachers that were very creative and did it very well. And we had others that just said, I can't even get my textbook on it, got kind of frustrated. Um, the students were figuring out ways to get around the filter, you know, because it was high school students. So it wasn't a seamless adoption. It was, it was positive, and it resulted in a lot of really good success stories. But at the same time, these, these issues were weighed really highly, and primarily because it wasn't the right device or the right computer. Um, so then we started thinking, okay, Here's the iPad. This is what's, this is obviously not going away. It has totally changed the marketplace for, for computers in general, uh, and it still is. So in 2011, uh, early 2012, we really started to look at doing this pretty large scale. Um, we had a, a good not, amount of Title I funds that we had to spend uh, before September. So we're talking about three or four million dollars that we had to spend or it would go away. Um, we also had some other money that we had sort of um, hadn't spent quite as much on some software, some things like that. So I won't call it a surplus, but we had some funds that we could use to supplement at non-Title I schools. So in April, uh, our school board, after a lot of lobbying by myself and by our superintendent, um, decided we're going to go ahead with this. So we focused on college and career readiness. We wanted to use the iPad knowing that, that mobile technology is everywhere in our society. And it's only going to be more prominent in the years to come. I mean, from, from police officers using it in their cars uh, instead of you know, traditional laptops or things like that. So I mean, you go to the restaurants now, and there's some restaurants that are totally wireless, and they take an order on their iPod Touch or their iPad. To really, you know, those are kind of small things, but to other, like, things like the health industry is really starting to adapt and doing more mobile things uh, for doctors and for a lot of different things. So we wanted to, to focus on college and career readiness and the student engagement piece. Um, and this is where sort of the interactive whiteboard conversation comes in. Uh, we did put in about 1,600 interactive whiteboards in 2008-2009 time frame. They're extremely expensive. Um, it was a big initiative for us. And in hindsight, I wish we wouldn't have done it. Now, at the time, it was pretty cutting edge and engaging software and, and hardware. But 
in retrospect, it has, and it's still, they're still out there, it, it, it's sort of a short-lived piece of technology. Um, looking back, we were in, in the 2008-2009 time frame, right before the iPad came out, and also right before LCD television started to drop in price rapidly, we were at an in-between state, where we were still very, very much you know, dominated by projector technology, and again, LCD screens of large size were extremely expensive, so it wasn't realistic to put flat screen TVs in classrooms at that time frame. It just wasn't, the technology wasn't there. In hindsight, again, I, you can't do anything about it today, but the iPad is probably more engaging and interactive than an interactive whiteboard ever was. So now there's technology out there that you really could just give a teacher an iPad and a projector and do something like an Apple TV for $100, so you're, you're maybe costing here $2,000, if not less, um, where an interactive whiteboard is in more in the $5,000 range at that time. Um, so that's where we started to talk about student engagement because that's one thing we'd always you know, pushed with ed tech is that it was about student engagement. You can't really measure ed tech having a huge you know, sort of result in all the students getting smarter and doing better on standardized tests. What you can do with, with ed tech is measure that engage, engagement level. Measure sort of are the students interested in what's going on or are there more students sort of checking out. Also, with the engagement side of things, we know our kids, the, the, the wealthiest to the poorest students, are surrounded by video games and whatever when they're outside of school. So you are competing. It's not great to say this, but a teacher is competing with YouTube and uh, video games and all this other sort of technology that's out there in society that our kids are exposed to every day. So we, we realize that, and also, again, Understanding that we need to do better with our dropout rate is to how to get these students more engaged in general. And really, if you've seen an iPad, there, there isn't much more engaging than an iPad as far as technology right now. So we sort of ran with it. Um, so we decided to do an implementation of about 8,000 iPads in middle and high schools, um, primarily as classroom sets. Uh, to start with, just because some of the schools had never done one-to-one. -one. Actually, we only had one school that's ever done a one-to-one. -one. So a lot of them were a little worried about the logistical things of giving, again, a 15 or 16-year-old an iPad to take home with them. So we started implementing. Uh, we started implementing with administrators, some teachers, all the technology staff, getting those that group comfortable in June and doing some training with them on what the iPad is and start planting these seeds on what they could start doing in the fall. Um, in July, we started doing a massive number of trainings with the teachers that were going to be in these classrooms with the iPads at the middle and the high school level. And then in this past August and September is when we started to implement it with the, with the students. Um, we elected not to do an insurance policy this time. Again, when we did the mini notebooks, it was extremely expensive. We also saw a lot of damages uh, because they weren't robust. So we decided to take the iPad and get OtterBox cases for every single iPad. That to me was a huge insurance. Um, so we're in February now and I, I, I talk to the school district quite a bit still um, and they still have yet to have a student damaged iPad. So whereas we were seeing about 40% 40, 40 damage rate in the traditional sort of mini laptops, they were seeing basically that was non-existent in the iPad. Again, primarily because of that OtterBox. But there was also a lot of student ownership because the iPad is cool, you know, for a lack of a better term. They really liked using the iPad in class. So, as a former teacher, we pu I pushed this with them as a classroom management tool. Saying no to using iPads that day in the classroom is a great way for classroom management. So if you have a class that's getting a little too rowdy or one or two students that are, you're, you, know, you can say, you know, I'm sorry, Johnny, you're going to have to put the iPad away today. You're not going to be using it. That, you only have to do that once or twice, and he's going to stay on task more just so he can keep using the iPad. So we did a lot of training in July on apps and paperless classrooms, using Google Docs or using uh, Evernote or whatever the case may be to get rid of the paper cost of classrooms too. 
because um, that's something I did when I was selling this to our school board, is to look at some of the research that was out there for the small number of schools that had done iPad implementations about the cost savings they see in paper. Um, if you've never been to a K-12 school in the last couple years, they spend an insane amount of money on copying, paper, all of that, printing. It is a lot of money. In a lot of school districts, it's probably one of their highest line items for the year is paper printing and copying costs. So there was a school in South Carolina as well, in Charleston, an elementary school that implemented iPads the year before we did. In one year, in the first year, they saved about $30,000 in just printing costs. And that was in the first year of implementation. So they weren't even like experts by any means at what they could be doing to be more paperless. They were just sort of going with it. And it just sort of happened that they were doing more online assessments. They were doing more Dropbox of assignments, doing a lot more with Google Drive and things like that, getting away from you know, having to print out 50 you know, quizzes that day or printing out the notes, just posting the notes online and the students just having them on their iPad as they're going through a presentation. So that was something we really started to push. Now, it wasn't all roses by any means. Um, pretty much my summer was, is what I now refer to as the iPad summer. It was crazy. I went and visited other school districts. Uh, San Diego School District had impl is, was implementing at the same time about 35,000 iPads while I was doing eight. So I was in communication with them a little bit. Um, just seeing what was going on and trying to figure all this out. So there still are issues down there. They're still very limited as far as e-textbooks. And, and if you've ever seen iBooks, iBooks could be the future of what textbooks could be. But I'm not even talking about limited number of iBooks. That's basically non-existent. I'm just talking about PDF versions of a textbook. We're very limited in our market in that area. Um, the syncing was, a it was definitely a lot better than what it was. Um, you could sync a cart if you did it via you know, a traditional MacBook in about you know, maybe a half an hour to an hour. Um, but we were also looking at mobile device management solutions so we could do some of this wirelessly. Uh, so we didn't have to, to always rely on the carts. We were really concerned about security and loss prevention and damage and repairs, but we haven't seen that. They still haven't seen that uh, now. Um, and then there's the, the constant sort of battle, if you will, between the PC IT folk and now the Apple IT folk and, and sort of finding that balance because that school district is doing things with iPads and, and to some extent a little bit of Mac Labs but it's still primarily all HP and PC computers. So it's blending those two environments so they're not sort of battling each other and using some of the really positive networking tools that are built into a PC environment through the server structure and through Active Directory and things like that and leverage it to use it on the iPad to manage those. So that was pretty huge in that school district and that was an example of sort of a district sponsored or a district provided initiative. Um, there are districts, again, San Diego School District, uh, the state of Maine is very proactive in the way they do their one-to-one -one computing environment. Uh, Maine has for years given middle and high school students a MacBook. Uh, now they're doing MacBook Airs. Uh, but now they've also started to give all K through third or second grade students iPads. And then those travel up with the students throughout their, their time when they're in the Maine School District or main state school district. Um, so the entire state is sort of blanketed with this one-to-one -one environment. So they're a good model to look at. Um, but again, San Diego is one of the really prominent ones. They are actually the largest buyer of iPads um, in public education at about 50,000 now, 55,000. So they've had a lot of headaches and they've been working through it, uh, but they're getting really good at it. And their hopes is to give every student in the entire district, which I believe is around 200,000 iPads at some point soon. Yes. Yep. And that's one of the reasons why Maine did it is because it is so rural that they jumped on ed tech quickly to sort of do that e-learning and to get everything online. So if a student's way out there or something's happening, and all the schools have the same resources. So it's, it's definitely more state-sponsored rather than locally sponsored, uh, but they have a really good professional development program also for their teachers uh, in the summertime and during breaks and things like that. 
So they're a really good example of what's going on. So that's, again, an example of a district putting up their money for this. The other thing that's happening right now in K-12 is bring your own technology. Um, and this is actually being adopted, in my views, faster than a state or like a school-sponsored app iPad deployment. So that's still happening. There's still districts that are going to buy their iPads, and they're going to give them to all the students. Those are the fortunate districts that can afford to. Now, though, the reality of the situation, most districts cannot afford to buy their students' iPads. Um, so what's happening, and this, again, is probably the biggest movement right now in, in K-12 ed tech, is bring your own technology, or BYOT. So we decided to do that as well. So we had this 8,000 iPad implementation, but at the same time, we wanted to say, hey, we've got this high school that it doesn't get Title I funding, so we can't put iPads into it. They have a very good principal that loves Google and, and was very into that technology of, of, you know, just he'd done it at a former school. Why don't we try BYOT at this one high school and see what happens? So that's what we did. We took one high school and did totally BYOT. Um, that was interesting because, you know, we're also doing this massive iPod rollout or iPad rollout at the same time trying to figure out BYOT. Some of those things did work together, uh, like we had to partition our wireless network into two areas. So at the, it's sort of your, you know, your secure wireless over here, and then sort of a more public, still filtered because we're talking about uh, K-12 education, but more of a public, like you go to Starbucks and you get on the Wi-Fi type of environment on this side. And at no point, and this was a hard thing for our guys to do because it, it was a lot of building and a lot of engineering, at no point do those wireless networks touch. So the back end of them, this BCSW, is on our secure network servers. The one over here, all it does is get filtered, and it's just the internet pipe. It doesn't hit any of the student information system. It doesn't hit anything else. So that was a big part of this, uh, because that studying some of the districts like Forsyth, Georgia, um, and then there's a district, and I have it up on another slide in Texas, that's doing really good things with BYOT. Looking at what they did and how they built their infrastructure was really, really important for this, and actually helped with the iPad Im implementation. Um, so what we started to do is starting to let the students use smartphones. That was the initial phase. So we did phase into it. Um, in this school district, for years, and this is, this is very similar in all school districts across the country, they had board policies against students bringing cell phones to school. The reality of that is, is every single one of them brought their cell phone to the school because all of them had cell phones. And again, I was in a district that had 56% free and reduced lunch. Even the poorest students had droids or had iPhones. Um, and a lot to do with that is culture. Because, you know, they may not be getting the most nutritious food or they may move a lot because that's something that happens in poverty is they're very transient. But they've got technology as far as a phone. They've got a lot of this stuff. And there's a lot of these providers like Cricket that you can get a monthly service plan on a droid or now an iPhone, and that's what they were doing. So and this took a couple years of, of really having some really high-level conversations is, our students are bringing these to school. We're not going to win that battle. So you have to pick your battles. You can't just let it go and just watch them in the hallways texting in their pocket or, you know, because that's what they were doing. Or even having the earbuds on and having a hoodie up so you couldn't see the earbuds. I mean, it was very obvious, anybody that was observing, that we're not going to win that battle. They're going to bring them in. So that was a lot of conversations, and they're very powerful now. You can do word processing and note-taking and Google things and find some answers and do student responses through, like, Poll Everywhere or Socrative or whatever. Let's start doing that with the smartphones and then phase in the students bringing their own tablets and whatever's. So that's what this school did. Their, their teachers were very much on board, and that was a huge part of it. Um, being a very good staff there, it's Bluffton High School in South Carolina, that they saw it themselves. They just, you know, and a lot of them had already kind of bypassed the board policy and had started letting their students use their cell phones in their classroom because they were tired of them being distracted by it. Um, the one thing I always say, the most powerful classroom management tool for a, for a smartphone is, is tell the student to take it out of their pocket and put it on the desk. 
Because if you as the teacher can see where the device is, then it's obvious when they're using it or not. When it's in their bag or their pocket is when they're going to break the rules. and then you know. So get it out in the open and, and start embracing it, and it changes all that. The other part of this, and what a lot of people were saying is, oh, you're going to have sexting, and you're going to have inappropriate things, and all this other stuff going on because the students have these phones now. And again, the argument that I kept making is they have it now. It's going to happen. And what we need to do is if you let it out there in the open, we start educating them on that. We start talking about digital literacy and start planning for how to prevent cyberbullying by teaching students younger and younger about the dangers of cyberbullying. So we did sort of a big, big push of doing a lot with digital literacy in our elementary and middle schools because the middle school is where it's happened the most. That's the roughest time. That's when they're really bad on Facebook. That's when they're sending all sorts of stuff on their phones and on their computers. So we started really educating that age group to try to prevent cyberbullying and, and if you don't teach them how to use their smartphone properly, they're going to keep on doing that, and it's just going to keep on going, and you're going to have these hor horrible examples of what can happen with cyberbullying. So that was really big. Um, again, on this, on this slide here, you can see that about 90% of our students in high school had a data and texting plan of some sort uh, with them, and again, 56% free and reduced lunch. Now, the issues were, were similar to the same ones with the iPads. Classroom management. What's it look like for a high school teacher to come into their chemistry class, let's say, and there's 30 students and all 30 of them have something different? You know, that five over there have their iPads and this three over here have an Android, whatever, because there's so many Android tablets. And these three only have BlackBerry phones, things like that. So it was a lot of professional development on things like Poll Everywhere and, and Google Docs that don't, it doesn't matter what type of device the student has. So we look for things like that. And Edmodo was another big one because that was the learning management system we used. And they had apps or access on anything. They didn't care. So the other big one that my, my security guys really were really freaking out about was the network security of, of partitioning that wireless. And I did get a call last week that it was compromised. Um, but that happens about every year anyways. So it, it wasn't compromised by a student bringing in their own device. They actually compromised the, in a computer lab, that they had broken through the secure wireless and the secure network, finding all the passwords, and then were giving them to the students that were bringing their own device so they could get on the secure wireless. So they did have an issue with that, and that's going to be, you know, kids are very, very smart and creative. Um, so that was an issue. The last point on here is the bandwidth requirements of a BYOT model and, and also with the iPads. We surprisingly did not see that. We did not see a huge influx of our bandwidth needs. Um, and, and, you know, knock on wood, they had, they, we doubled our bandwidth just to be safe, and that's expensive to do, but it's not peaking out. It's peaking at higher than what it would have been if we hadn't gotten more but it's not peaking at all 200 megs of our pipe. So that was, that was a really interesting sort of byproduct of this, is that we, we really were worried about bandwidth requirements leading up to this, and it, it wasn't. It was never, it hasn't gotten to be an issue. It was actually better now, since we increased anyways, than it had been the previous school year, even without the iPads and the sort of BYO. So I see that, those are the two sort of trends right now. You have um, the districts, again, that, are, that have the money that can provide the iPads, and then you have the districts on the other side that, that are going to invest more in infrastructure and security and let the students bring whatever they have. Um, so a few of these up here, Mooresville is in, Georgia, uh, in North Carolina. They have a fantastic superintendent. They provide all of their students, now I think MacBook Airs, um, and then the lower grades, iPads. Um, KDISD, that's the school district in uh, Texas that I was talking about, they actually do both. So in their Title I schools, they provide iPads. In their non-Title schools, they do BYOT and allow those students to bring them in. So they're doing some really good things. San Diego Unified I talked about and Maine I talked about as far as sort of massive scale iPad deployments and they're going strictly iPads. And then the, the bottom one is my friends down in Forsyth, Georgia, 
They have been on uh, 60 Minutes. They've been on CNN. They are doing BYOT at a massive scale and very creatively and very thought out that to the point they have gotten such a atmosphere there of this embracing BYOT that they let kindergartners bring in whatever they have, and a lot of them bring in those uh, DSs. Yes. Because there's apps, or not apps, or there's games that you can like do note-taking. Wire. I don't know very much about the DS, but I saw some of the things I visited there, and I was just blown away. Yeah, yeah, and I had no idea. I didn't even, you know, I had a Game Boy a long time ago. I didn't know what these things were. So I thought it was just a Game Boy Color or something, and it isn't. It connects to the Internet. It can do a lot of these things. So they've gotten to the level of, like, just embracing that atmosphere that these kids are bringing gaming devices in and using them for educational purposes. They've also done a lot of work with the classroom management side of BYOT to, to the best way to structure your classroom. To say that every activity does not have to involve the iPad or the whatever. That there are definite activities that it's very useful for, but if it ever gets to a point where you need to lecture and go back to that style for 20 minutes to to hit a concept, it's fine to tell all of them to turn off or power down. That they have structured it really well and worked with their teachers very well on this. Hilliard schools here in, in the Columbus area are starting to do BYOT. Um, but they're doing it, again, very gradually. Uh, they have, I think, uh, my, my sister's boyfriend's daughter uh, was telling me they have, like, yeah, it was. Uh, they, they have, like, green spaces. I forget what they're calling them, but they've termed them really kind of a creative way, where it's like a green zone where you can go in and you can use your Kindle, and you can do some of this, and then they're gradually... the when the teacher's comfortable for it, the teachers are now pulling in the Kindles, the Nooks, the iPads, or whatever, into their lessons. But being very mindful that not every student's got one right now. So there is some of that equity issues. Um, so they haven't worked that out uh, totally, but there are school districts right here in Columbus, in this area, that are starting to do BYOT. And there is talks that more are going to start doing more iPad implementations, but again, that goes to that funding model. So... Um, we'll see, we'll see. Now, the future I see it is, is you got to look at what's happening in society. So the, the, the one thing that's happening in society is there's going to be more mobile devices. Be it Androids, be it iPads, be it phones, whatever they are, and now there's a new BlackBerry touchscreen and they're basically banking their entire company on a new phone. It's, it's, it's reality. In in all jobs that there are today, there's going to be more mobile technology built into your jobs. And this is a big thing now about, you know, what is a 40-hour work week look like? I mean, because you're always connected. you got your work email right there on your iPhone. You're really always kind of working, even if it's in a sort of passive way. So what, you know, education has to do, in my opinion, is that they have to embrace it. And you, you can't there are, there's a bit of a movement by some people that they're going to just hide their head in the sand and sort of push back and say, we are not going to do anything with technology, that we're just going to teach you know, traditional textbooks, I'm going to you know, print a million things, and you know, it was good enough for the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, it's going to be good enough for the 2010s and 20s. Um, that's not reality. Again, our students today, especially our young learners and our, well, our college kids here now too, um, there's constant noise, if you will, around them at all times with Facebook, with Twitter, with video games, everything. We are in a very rapid sort of YouTube generation type of setting that they want their information quickly and they want it in small bites. They don't want 45 minutes of a lecture. They don't want that. They want it trimmed down and concise and they want it to have access at all times. So it would be doing a disservice to the way these students' brains have been structured. And there's a lot of, again, I'm a master's, there's a lot of research done in that younger people's brains fire differently. The synopsis of the brain is not like, you know, older people is is a lot slower, if you will. The brain works a little bit slower. That we need to adapt our teaching styles to meet the needs of these new new generation of students. Um, I think, again, like I said, you're going to see the ones that can afford it are going to embrace the iPad. Because right now, even though it's not perfect as far as managing a large number of iPads, 
it's years ahead of what you can do on an Android environment. Um, the Windows tablet environment is just now starting to emerge, so it'll be interesting to see if they get into this game a little bit. They've lost about two and a half years of worth, you know, of, of, of playing now, but we'll see. Um, because there are things, like I said, like Active Directory that would be really nice to have on a lot of management side. I also think that over time, you're going to see state departments funding this a lot better. Um, and it could go either way. It, 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 one thing in North Carolina is they don't provide any hardware or any funding for hardware. But in North Carolina, they provide all the bandwidth for all of their schools. That's a huge cost savings for the school. So what the schools have to do, or the districts in North Carolina, is they build a report based on their internet usage for that year saying we need X amount of bandwidth more for next year. We're going to do BYOT, so we're going to have a, an in increase. North Carolina's tech department approves that and sends more bandwidth their way. It also saves North Carolina school districts money because they're buying it from all multiple providers but through one central source. So the State Department gets a better discount than what a local school district could on the bandwidth. So that's a really nice structure there. And then there's these you know, things that, I, that for good or bad, there's a lot of virtual high schools popping up. And they're, most of those are state-sponsored. Um, I'm not a huge fan of them because they use canned content that it's not a living teacher that's teaching the content. Um, in my former district, we actually built our own sort of virtual course environment using our own teachers, and it was only small scale, but it, it, I thought it was more interactive than you know just listening to a, a recorded lecture five years ago that you'd never meet that teacher. Um, I think there's going to be a lot more blended and hybrid learning because of that. Um, we're starting to see there's a school district in Boyne, Michigan, that did, he did a, an iPad implementation in elementary school, and his teachers are building iTunes U courses. And the students, all these, you know, third and fourth graders, all have iPads and they all have all of their content in iTunes U. So it's just right there with them 24 7. It's, it's just, and I really like that model. Um, Open High School in Utah is a charter school in Utah that's totally blended. So, some of their work they can do 100% online, and they don't need to come to school. So about three days a week, though, they do come to school. And what it is, it's in a building that is like an old factory, and they remodeled the entire factory, and they built cubicles for the students, and they do individual learning paths for every single student in that high school. So they can do some, again, some modules and some courses they can do online, but a lot of them, again, like chemistry labs, physics, things like that, where you need to touch things and you need to do those physical experiments, they still have a physical space for those students to come work in. And then they have little sort of uh, classrooms, mini classrooms and labs that are in that space that a teacher who's more of like a facilitator can gather 20 students on the fly, go into a lab and do a demonstration, and then the students go back out and work a lot independently. So it, it's been pretty successful out there in Utah. So that's really, really interesting stuff going on there with what, what a high school can look like and sort of that traditional, you come five days, you're there seven and a half hours a day for 190 days a year. Is that the best way? Or could that be restructured in the United States to be more flexible? The other uh, couple things that are really cool is adaptive software. So that uses sort of learning analytics and, and sort of the, what's happening with that child to improve education software. Um, Khan Academy has started to do this, where they've built a math module that's adaptive. So you start working these math problems, and if you get to a certain level and you get it wrong, it then releases a lecture or a mini sort of tutoring session on what you made wrong, like, and reteaches those values, and then you work your, back, your way back up. So that, to me, is very interesting on where that's going to go. Um, and I think there is going to be a greater expectation that every teacher is going to be implementing technology. And that's something I saw firsthand, is that you would have these teachers that would adopt technology quickly, and parents can be very vocal. So the parent of, you know, Johnny's in this class with this teacher that's doing all this crazy, you know, innovative stuff, and he's really learning well because it's interesting to him and he's engaged, and then Susie's in a class that's more traditional, and that, te that parent starts to complain quite a bit because Susie's bored or Susie's not learning very well, 
it's because Susie's, you know, doing a lot of worksheets and doing a lot of more of the traditional things. So I saw that firsthand in South Carolina, and parents have a lot of power over what sort of road a school or a school district's going to take based on that's voting for school board. It's, it's a lot of different things. Um, so you're gonna, I think you're going to see a lot of administrators pushing the teachers to do this, that it's not, okay, you can do this if you want. It's going to be more of the conversation, you're going you're gonna to do this. You're going to adopt this sort of technology. Now, it'll be flexible on you can do this amount. You know, everybody has to have a website, but you're going to have to do something. Um, and again, I know I've mentioned a couple times, that's why I love Edmodo being free. There is no easier website creation or learning management system that I've seen than Edmodo. It is, it's just like Facebook, um, and the students really, really loved it. So all of this is about K-12, but sort of the last slide here is, is sort of us. What does this mean for Ohio State, and what does this mean for higher ed in general? And what this means is we've got some pretty tech-savvy, you know, kindergarteners out there that in 12 years are going to be here at OSU. There's also, you know, if you push it down a little bit, the next generation that starts to come up here are going to have seen iPads. Um, so in 1996 is sort of when the Internet boomed and everything sort of changed from there. That's, what, 17 years ago now? So even our freshmen that are incoming to Ohio State next year didn't, have never lived in a world without sort of the, the Internet 1.0 or 2.0 sort of life. And that's, that's pretty wild to think about, but it's reality. And right now, you know, we have seniors and juniors here at OSU that the iPad wasn't out when they came to Ohio State. That can never be said again. Um, there's now a generation of students that have, have almost went through high school, all of high school, with the iPad out there. Maybe not at their school, but just that mobile technology boom that's happened in the last few years is, is quickly trickling up to us. And it's already started. I mean, you walk around campus, you ride a bus, you do whatever, every student's got a smartphone. It, it's not like, you know, that we can't even really get to the percentages. It's, it's all of them, you know. And, and what we're seeing from our end is that 70% of our wireless traffic is iPhones. So it's, there's, they have them. We know that our students have them, and they're adopting Apple quicker than anything else. Now, the iPad's a little bit slower in the adoption rate. Um, we're seeing about 20% of OSU students have iPads. But we see that boom every single year now at the beginning of school, but also after the holiday season because uh, a lot of them get them for Christmas or you know, Hanukkah or whatever as a gift. So we see we, every year we see that increase. Um, part of what we're doing with Digital First is educating students on the cost effectiveness of digital textbooks versus a traditional textbook. So there is a, a chemistry series that the textbook's about $220. The digital version is $75. So we're looking at these GECs especially, the iPad could really pay for itself in one academic school year if the student buys all digital textbooks rather than a traditional textbook. Um, so there's a lot of that. And, and the kids are going to be smarter as they come here as far as how to use technology. Um, Google Apps for Education is a program that it gives enterprise access to all the Google Docs and you know, creating emails and creating accounts to school districts for free. And that's being adopted quite quickly, again, because it's free. You don't have to pay for any of that. It has built-in security and all this stuff. So our students are going to come to you know, higher ed again with more knowledge of how to use the cloud and how to use word processing online and be more paperless themselves. So we need to really prepare for that because this generation is totally different than the previous generation. Um, so we, there's going to be an expectation of... OSU and higher ed to be 24-7 access to content. Um, and I'm not even really saying, oh, you have to do MOOCs and we're going to have to give credits for students completing MOOCs. That's not even really part of the conversation. This is more about the physical on-campus experience. Blending the learning so that students can bring their iPads to class and, you know, an hour after class, that lecture is also going to be available to them and they can download it to their iPad or whatever the case may be. Um, to, to give that to our students, to have that level of access. Um, I was just talking to somebody the other day, and we were talking about these massive lectures and how unengaging a 600-person lecture can be for, for an 18-year-old. Because um, I can remember it. I went to OSU, so I, 
I had a biology course that was about 750 student lecture hall. I didn't learn anything. I, I was totally checked out the whole time, and I had the textbook right in front of me the whole time. I didn't have an iPad or an iPhone. So kids are on Facebook now, you know, things like that. It's how you can use social networking or use student response, how you can break up those lectures, flipping the classroom, doing these things to make those lectures or making that learning environment more engaging for the student. So I think that's sort of our task at hand in, in, in the Digital First team and, and really OSU at large is, is that engagement factor and, and to improve sort of the student learning experience um, so that they're, you know, they're excited to come to class and they're excited and they're able to use their iPads or their iPhones or their droids or whatever they got to, to be more productive. So that's a lot of information. Um, this is my email. Again, this is the Digital First website. Um, again, I'm very passionate about this. I've been accepted into a PhD program here at Ohio State for education. So I, I'm very excited about what the future holds. Um, I'm excited about what's going on at Ohio State, and that's the reason I came back home to do this is because uh, Mike Hoffer and his group is, is really doing some incredible things. So I'm excited to be part of it. Um, so questions? Anyone? Thank you a lot. Yes. <laughs> yes. Did you have any uh, work in progress project that was at the faculty member now? Um, w meaning what type of projects? Because we're doing a lot of different things. Can you name the several things like you? Okay. Um, so we're seeing a lot of movement towards iTunes U, um, either from an open standpoint, um, where you make your courses public sort of like publishing a book where you take all of your lectures and PDFs and whatever, put them in this nice package and then put it out there for the world and your students locally. So we're seeing a lot of momentum in that regards. Um, we're seeing a lot now of iPad adoption or at least interest in doing more student-oriented adoptions of iPads here at Ohio State. Um, so the athletics, all the student athletes have iPads. Um, College of Medicine, I, I would imagine, will probably be adopting it next year. College of Education's in talks of possibly doing some iPad rollouts, so there's a lot of interest there. Um, we're starting to see some interest with iBooks, with, with uh, professors sort of looking at what the textbook could be in the future. Um, the limiting factor with the, the iBook is that it's only viewable on an iPad, and not, and we, not all the students have iPads. So you know, that's a hard sort of embracing if, if you know not all of your students are going to have the iPads. So, um, and then we are seeing a lot of MOOCs, um, things like that. Classroom technology is changing quite a bit. Uh, these, you know, computer labs, like the, we're building new digital unions. Uh, there's one in Haggerty uh, now that's a really neat space, 171 Haggerty. So it's sort of a, it has Macs in there, but there's collaboration stations as well. So, Rethinking that sort of traditional computer lab, even with just rows and rows and rows of computers, on how that could be better for the students so they could learn in groups and do collaborative meetings better. Um, but there's a lot of movement, even to do things like I'm doing now, recording my lecture, if you will, on an iPad. There's ways that you could use mobile technology from the professor standpoint. So um, I could have used my laptop and I have a $90 piece of software that would allow me to, to capture everything happening on my laptop and my voice. But this is, I have an iPad, and this app's $2.99. So instead of spending $99 per laptop, $2.99 is a pretty good sell. So uh, deans definitely see that as a, as a positive way to use iPads to teach off of. So we're seeing a lot of movement in that regard. Um, so hopefully we'll see you know, more large scale and more student impact as far as the students having the devices. That's my hope. Um, but it's, it's getting there. It's getting there. Thank you. Well, if you have any questions, please email me. Um, I can give talks to your department, things like that, whatever you need.